Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. My name is Claire Haley. I'm the Vice President of Public Relations and Programs here for the History Center, and I am so thrilled to be welcoming our featured author tonight, H.W. Brands. He is joining us to discuss his 16th, is that right, and newest book, um, our first civil war, patriots and loyalists and um, the American Revolution. So again, if you haven't yet purchased your copy of the book, you can do so from Atlanta History Center's museum store. Uh, my colleague Monique, who is running things on the back end, she will be posting a link to do that in the chat. And again, it is 25% off, so your perfect um, bedtime reading selection or Christmas gift, whichever you prefer, uh, for the history lover in your life uh, coming up. I'm gonna to quickly introduce tonight's guest. If you've joined us for any of our author talks before, there's a good chance that you've joined us uh, when we hosted Professor Brands before. Um, we've been fortunate to host him several times at Atlanta History Center, and including this is the second time we've hosted him virtually as well. H.W. Brands holds the Jack S. Blanton Senior Chair of History at the University of Texas in Austin. He's joining us from Austin tonight. He has written more than a dozen biographies and histories, two of which, the first American and traitor to his class, were finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. And the, his uh, more recent book, The General versus the President, was a New York Times bestseller. And again, we're so excited to welcome him for his newest book tonight, um, he'll be giving a presentation, and then after that, he will be taking your questions. So as Professor Brands is talking, if you think of any questions for him, go ahead and drop those in the Q&A, and we'll get to as many of those as we can, um, as much as time allows. So again, thank you so much for being here, for joining us virtually, and Professor Brands, welcome to Atlanta History Center. We're so excited that you're back. Well, thank you. Thank you, Claire. I'm delighted to be back. Thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you to the Atlanta History Center, and thank you for all the good work that you do. I'm delighted to be speaking to the audience, if only virtually again. I hope we can do this in person sometime soon. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about this book that I wrote on the American Revolutionary War. And I started thinking about the American Revolutionary War a long time ago. I teach American history. And I make a point of teaching introductory classes in American history. So every year I teach about the American Revolutionary War. I've studied it in greater detail on a number of occasions in the past. I suppose my first serious brush with it was for a book that I did about Benjamin Franklin. And that book was called The First American. I called the my biography of Benjamin Franklin, the first American, because it occurred to me that Benjamin Franklin was of that first generation of people who considered themselves Americans as opposed to Englishmen. And in Franklin's case, as in the case of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and James Monroe and the whole bunch, they were born Englishmen, but they died Americans. So at some point in their life, they made this change, this change of identity. And this question of who do you think you are, who do you define yourself to be, strikes me as an aspect of politics that really goes to the heart of what it means to be part of a democracy. I confess that I was drawn to look at this decision in the earliest phase of American history, in part because of my perception of what's happening in American politics today. And I was aware of the increasing distance between people who consider themselves conservatives and those who consider themselves liberals. And this has been going on for a while, probably since at least since the 1990s, you could take it back to the 1960s. But there was a time when the two political parties had more philosophical or ideological overlap than they do now. There was a time, for example, when the Democratic Party had a great many conservatives, mostly Southerners, and the Republican Party had a lot of liberals, especially sort of New England, Northeastern types. But those days ended in the late 20th century until by 2000, basically. If you are politically active in this country and you're conservative, you're a Republican. If you're liberal, you're a Democrat. And there's not much overlap between the two. Now, I started my book on the American Revolutionary War long before this last summer. The book was done and I was actually at the printer when I saw a report of a survey that was done. I can't remember exactly who did the survey, but it reported what struck me as alarming news, that 50% of the people who were asked responded to the question, do you think it would be a good idea for the conservative states in America to separate from the liberal states? 
essentially, I don't know if they use the term secession exactly, but could you imagine, do you think it'd be a good idea for these two groups to, to move apart? And I say, I was alarmed to hear that 50% of Republicans said yes, and 46% of Democrats said yes. Now, I'm not going to predict what's going to happen in the future. I don't know what this portends, but it is, it strikes me as worrisome for someone who is a fan like me of the American experiment in self-government. And I'm fully prepared as a historian to say it's an experiment that is still ongoing. It's tempting. It's tempting to think that because American democracy has been around for more than two centuries, it's destined to last forever. Well, nothing in human history lasts forever. I, I don't know. I certainly hope that we are not on the leading edge of the end of this. You know, it would be, be a disaster for Americans, for American democracy, I think for democracy everywhere. But it still is worrisome. But I, and so it was with a sense that this was going on. As I say, it was before I read this, this recent poll. But it was a sense that Americans are sort of redefining themselves that drew me to the time when Americans had to first define themselves. As I say, Benjamin Franklin and his peers of that generation, they were born Englishmen, you know, politically speaking, they were born Englishmen, they were subject to the British Empire, and they lived most of their lives. In the case of Benjamin Franklin, he lived the first seven decades of his life as not only an Englishman or a Briton, but an enthusiastic Britain. Benjamin Franklin was a fan of the British Empire, but he changed his mind about the empire in the beginning of the eighth decade of his life. So I wanted to know why. Now, this also requires me, allows me to take a closer look at what the American Revolution was all about. As I say, I teach history to introductory students. Um, every semester I have a whole lot of freshmen in my class and most of them, they're, they're good students, they're smart, they've, they've had history before. But if I ask them what the American Revolution was about in a single line, they would say, Americans get fed up with British laws, declare their independence, fight a war and win. And there it is. But it's more complicated than that. And if I have a single sort of rule of thumb regarding history, is it is that it's more complicated than you think. And this is almost independent of how complicated you think history is. As complicated as you think it might be, it's more complicated than that. Now, some people, some people find this off-putting because they, when they go looking in the past, presumably for answers, for guidance to today's issues or questions, they want a straightforward answer. But history doesn't give those straightforward answers. It gives confusing answers. I happen to like this. I like complicated things. I like peeling the onion and knowing that there's another layer inside and another layer inside that. It just seems to me to make the story more interesting. It's this multi-layered story. But in the case of the American Revolution, this, this one line description, Americans against the British, not only is it an oversimplification, but it really hides what to me is sort of the central moral question of the story. And I will confess that as I get older, I become more drawn to the idea that the fundamental questions in history are moral questions. They're questions of, of what are your values? What are you going to do when faced with this particular challenge? I pose these questions to my students all the time. And for 18 and 19 year olds, my, the freshmen in my classes, in, in many cases, it's new that they're asked to think about these. I point out though, that there aren't any simple answers. These are, these are kind of like questions in philosophy where we ask, we keep asking the questions and we have to keep asking the questions because we never get definitive ideas. For people, I used to teach mathematics. And so I, I taught math and I taught history. And those of you who remember your math classes, maybe, maybe you preferred math classes or engineering or science, because one of the appeals of that is there's a question, there's a problem, there's an answer. And the answer is either right or wrong. That's the way it is with hard sciences, with mathematics. And for many people, that's an attraction. But history, human affairs, the human heart, there's never just a right or wrong answer. There's this messy stuff that goes on all the time. So the moral question that I pose for myself in studying the American Re Revolution, that essentially I pose to the figures that I study, the people that I study in this book is, what 
causes a person to forsake his country and take arms against it. So what makes somebody say, I'm no longer part of that country. I'm no longer that person I used to be. I have this new identity, this new loyalty, this new allegiance, and I'm going to act on it. What causes that to happen? And when I pose the question this way, I hope, well, for me, and I hope for readers, it causes sort of a rethink of the premises of the American Revolution, because the conventional American take on the American Revolution is that, well, of course, George Washington is going to stand for American independence. And of course, Benjamin Franklin is going to become a revolutionary. And of course, John Adams is going to do this. And Thomas Jefferson is going to write the Declaration of Independence and all this stuff. Well, I think that, of course, is a big leap that requires substantiation. Because I don't think there's any of course about it. It wasn't as though the default historical position for Americans was to launch a revolution, a rebellion against Britain. No, in fact, the default position was to remain loyal to Britain. And so I examine this question, what causes a person to forsake his country and take arms against it? I pose the question to several individuals that are alive during this time that have to make this decision. Are you going to stay with your country, with Britain, or are you going to take arms against it? How do you decide this? What prompts one person to become a rebel and another person very similar in all sorts of characteristics to remain loyal? What's going on here? And in telling this story, in posing these questions and coming up with the answers as best I can for the individuals I look at, I bring together what I conceive of as two different realms of history. There are the realm that I call big history and little history. Big history is the history of public affairs. It's the history of government actions. It's the rise and fall of empires. It's war and peace. It's industrial revolutions. It's the launch of the Apollo spaceship to the moon. It's the big stuff you read about in the history books, you read about in the newspapers in real time. That's big history. And that's most of what people study in history books. That's what makes it into the history books. But there's another realm of history, what I call little history. And this is the history of individuals. This is a history of private life. It's the history of what did you do this morning and why did you do that? What caused you to make this decision rather than that? And in approaching this question of what causes a person to forsake his country, et cetera, we see, I see anyway, in interpreting these and displaying these for my readers, I see the two realms of history coming together because at one level, George Washington took up arms against the British Empire because he felt that Americans' rights, Americans' natural rights were being infringed. So that's a big history kind of thing. But there's more to it than that because there were other people who were situated fairly similarly to Washington, who agreed that Americans' rights were being infringed in some ways, but who did not make that next step to say, okay, and we're going to start a war over it. I point out in my book, and I think I explain why George Washington is a very unlikely rebel. Rebels, revolutionaries, people who try to overturn the status quo and replace it with something else, they usually are ill-served by the existing status quo. That's what they've got against the status quo. The status quo is preventing me from achieving the success I want, to, uh, I want to achieve or something like that. But the status quo had been very kind to George Washington. George Washington was one of the most distinguished, wealthiest, accomplished men in Virginia. Among the class of people that George Washington lived with, the planter class in Virginia, no one was doing better than George Washington. Yet George Washington became a rebel. He committed treason against his country. He took arms against Britain. Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was an even less likely rebel, revolutionary, than George Washington. Benjamin Franklin had succeeded within the context of the British Empire, as no one else of his generation had succeeded. I pose a question to my students, I'll pose it to you. If there had never been an American Revolution, 
which of the founding generation, the kind of people who come to mind, which of them would the world have heard of absent American revolution? Would the world have heard of George Washington? Well, quite likely not, because the world heard of George Washington because he was the commanding general of the Continental Army in the Revolutionary War. No revolution, no Continental Army. George Washington remains well, well known in the vicinity of Mount Vernon, but in the broader world, no, they never would have. The world had not heard of George Washington before 1775. So if 1775 hadn't happened the way it did, the world might never have heard of George Washington. Would the world have heard of John Adams, a Massachusetts lawyer? Quite possibly not. Would the world have heard of Thomas Jefferson? Jefferson was famous for writing the Declaration of Independence. No American Revolution, no Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson is left doing his own scribbling on in his mountaintop home in Monticello. The world wouldn't have known. The world, the only founding father, the only member of that generation we can guarantee you would have heard of, if not for an American revolution, was Benjamin Franklin. Because Benjamin Franklin was world famous before the American revolution. He had become known to the world through his writings and especially through his scientific experiments. So he was known to the scientists, to the literati of Britain, of continental Europe, of other parts of the world. So Franklin, and he achieved this all within the British Empire. And he could not have achieved the success in any other political system, in any other empire or country in the world. He was born into a family of very modest means in Boston. He ran away from home at the age of 17 and landed in Philadelphia, which happened to be one of the most tolerant cities in the world. And it suited his attitude toward life just perfectly. It allowed him to be a great success, this kid who arrives with no money, but talent, ambition, and diligence. And he makes a career for himself. He succeeds so well as a printer and a publisher that he's able to retire at the age of 42 and live off his accumulated wealth and continuing profits from the companies that he's spun off that are operated by the active partners while he's the silent partner. Benjamin Franklin was able to accomplish this within the British Empire, and it gets better. So in his retirement, he becomes this world famous scientist. He moves to London. He goes there to serve as the agent, the lobbyist of the Pennsylvania Assembly, which had its gripes with the Pennsylvania governor. And so they wanted their viewpoint heard before Parliament. They send Franklin off. He was a persuasive fellow. And he landed in London and he thought, oh my gosh, this is the best place ever. This has to be the greatest city on earth because it suited him perfectly. He made friends. He acquired admirers. His reputation grew. It's when he's in London, he is given the honorary doctorate for, by which he is called Dr. Franklin ever after. And he thinks that the British Empire is the greatest thing going. This deep into his 60s. In fact, if his wife, Debbie, had not been so reluctant to leave Philadelphia, she said it was because she didn't like to sail. She was scared of sailing the way people today, some people are scared of flying. It was also because she knew that Philadelphia suited her in a way that London did not. But if she, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, tried to persuade Debbie to move to London with him, and that would have been a permanent relocation. And if that had happened, this is striking. So this is where little history would have changed big history, because if the Franklins had been residents in London, and this was before the Stamp Act, before all the other stuff happened that started to separate the colonies from the mother country, if Franklin had been essentially an American expatriate living in London, then when the rift opened between the colonies and the mother country, Franklin quite likely would have been on the side of the mother country. And this could have had profound effects on American history because there are two individuals who are usually thought to be the indispensable pair in the success of the American Revolution, George Washington, who heads the Continental Army, and Benjamin Franklin, who heads America's diplomatic effort to achieve the French alliance that was absolutely necessary to American success in the war. So both of these men become revolutionaries. Why does this happen? And I'm not going to give you just a single answer as to why it happens, because of course I want you to read the book, it's, but it's complicated. But there are other people who decide not 
to become revolutionaries. Now, I will repeat that for Franklin and Washington, they were the ones who made the leap. People who stayed loyal to Britain, they didn't make a leap at all. And this, once again, is where if you know how history is going to turn out, if you know that this revolution is going to be a success, then looking back, you're looking for the ones who initiated this process, the ones who got on the right side of history early on, and they gain our admiration, especially if you're an American and you like the idea of American independence and what the United States became. But it was not at all obvious that this was going to happen. And in any event, they were the ones who made the break. But because we know how things turns out, we tend to think it's inevitable that that's going to happen. Of course, they're going to take that path. But no, there wasn't any of course about it all. There were people, Thomas Hutchinson is an individual that I profile. Thomas Hutchinson was one who grew up in Boston about the same time as Benjamin Franklin. They knew many of the same people. Hutchinson and Franklin cooperated in various initiatives where the colonies worked together, Franklin representing Pennsylvania and Hutchinson representing Massachusetts. Hutchinson eventually became governor of Massachusetts. But Hutchinson didn't have that rebellious streak in him. I said that Benjamin Franklin ran away from home at the age of 17. That's one of the first indications that the rebellion is coming out. Now, I'm not going to put Franklin on the couch and say he rebelled against his father at the age of 17, so he rebels against King George at the age of 70. It's more complicated than that. But there is an element of that there. There's an element in Franklin that says to other people, don't tell me what to do. I will decide myself. And if you had to characterize the people who become patriots, the patriot is the term for the, the rebels, the ones who become, who want independence. Those who become patriots are, they lean more in the direction of don't tell me what to do. I suspect that many of you in the audience will have your own perception of this and your own judgment, but I'm just going to put something out there. And that is this idea of don't tell me what to do runs deep in the American character. There are lots of American characters, but when Americans think of themselves, there is this idea of don't tell me what to do. Individualism is more prized in the United States and in American society and culture than it is in many other places. But Hutchinson, Hutchinson didn't take that rebel route. He took the route of loyalty. He had taken an oath of office as governor of Massachusetts to serve the interests of Britain and serve his king. I will point out, so had Benjamin Franklin. He was postmaster general of the colonies. This was a British office, and he had taken an oath as well. Now, Franklin broke his oath. Thomas Hutchinson did not. Why did he not? Well, again, there's a personal element. Hutchinson had a personality that was less inclined to rock the boat than Franklin, but some of it had to do with the way Hutchinson was treated during the run-up to the American Revolution. So Hutchinson, at the time of the Stamp Act crisis of 1765, Parliament passed a law imposing new taxes on the American colonies. And a lot of people in the colonies resented and rejected this. This was when the no taxation without representation slogan developed. Now, Hutchinson was in charge of enforcing the Stamp Act. And so protesters in Boston, protesters, it's a polite term for the Boston mob. Some of them were members of something called the Sons of Liberty, but they, they dragged in ruffians and anybody who was willing to mix things up. And they attacked Thomas Hutchinson's house. Initially, when Hutchinson and his family were in there sitting down to dinner, but they fled. And then they dismantled the house board by board. It took them all night. But in the morning, Hutchinson was left with his house in a ruin. If he had not fled, he might very well have been hanged. He was hanged in effigy, and they might very well have hanged him. And Hutchinson asked himself, what did I do to deserve this? I'm simply trying to carry out the law. But the point here is that already, already the two sides were separating. John Adams said that at the beginning of the American Revolution, about a third of the American population consisted of patriots 
and about a third consisted of loyalists. And the middle third, they hadn't decided. They mostly wanted to be left alone. But one of the strategies of the two sides in a conflict like this, what I call a civil war because it's American against American, one of the strategies of both sides is to force those people in the middle to choose sides. So, so you ramp up the violence, you provoke and you cause people, your enemy presumably, to overreact. And that alienates people who might have been favorable to that other side, and now they come over to your side. So these acts of provocation, like the Stamp Act riots, and later the Boston Tea Party, this vandalism, this destruction of millions of dollars worth of tea. The whole point was to get the British government to overreact. And then, and then some people who hadn't taken sides would feel offended or they would feel injured by the laws, by the reactionary laws that the British government passes, and then they would side with the patriots. So this sort of dynamic sets in. I've, identi I've identified now some fairly high profile people who had to make this decision, but everybody in America had to make decisions. People of middling backgrounds, it goes all the way down the social ladder to enslaved peoples. And this becomes an issue when the British government, early in the fighting, issues an edict, a proclamation offering emancipation to any slaves of patriot masters, of rebel masters. If those people, and they were targeted specifically at young men, men of military age, if they will flee their masters, cross the military lines, and join the British to fight against their former masters. So the British offer emancipation. And the enslaved peoples who hear about this, again, especially the young men, they've got to make a decision. They have to make a calculation. In the first place, do they think this is a good idea? Most, uh, most enslaved peoples think emancipation is a good idea, but it's not always and everywhere an automatic response because the question is, so what's my life going to be like after emancipation? One of the individuals that I profile was a man named Boston King. Boston King was enslaved to a patriot master and he heard about the British offer and he's thinking about, well, do I take it or not? Now, Boston King later wrote a memoir and he said, he just set out that as a child, as a young person, as a young slave, he thought he had life pretty easy. His father was a skilled laborer for their master, and he, the son, was treated, the word he uses, he was basically treated like a pet. So he didn't have to work and he got to play most of the time. Even as he became old enough to work on his own, he initially got sort of fairly light labor. And so he was really not particularly inclined to accept this British offer because that offer came with all sorts of risk. In the first place, you have to flee the plantation and you might get caught before you get away. And then you have to go through military lines. You might get caught there or you might get shot and killed there. And then where do you wind up? You wind up in the British army and you might get shot while fighting for the British army. If you stay on the plantation, you're not going to get shot. You're just going to keep doing what you're doing. So Boston King deferred making decision until, until he was accused of a crime, accused of doing something wrong, and he's about to get punished for it when he hadn't done it at all. And this is where that little history and the big history intersect. Because probably, as Boston King admitted, if not for that, he wouldn't have taken the chance of accepting the British offer, but he does take the chance. And he fights on behalf of the British. His fighting takes them all over the the colonies and even out to sea for a while. And he winds up eventually in loyalist New York City. New York City was a stronghold of loyalism throughout the war. And there's still the question for Boston King and people in a position similar to his. So what happens if the British win the war? Are they going to actually follow through on their promise? Because the British have not ended slavery within the British Empire. It's not as though the Americans were the only with slaves in this. There are plenty of British slaves in the West Indies. So are the British going to follow through? He didn't know. What would happen if the British lose the war? 
Are the British then going to abandon the slaves that came over to their side? What happens then? So it's entirely possible that he could be worse off than before. Now, I don't want to give away too much of the ending, but it has, for Boston King, it has a relatively happy ending. This matter of deciding, it involves even the Native American peoples, the Indian tribes. They have to choose. Well, in fact, the Indian tribes were used to having to choose between various groups of Europeans. They'd been doing it for, for centuries. So for the last hundred years, the Indians of North America in, say, say, upstate New York and Pennsylvania, they'd been having to choose between the French and the British. The French and Indian War was called the French and Indian War, not because it was the French against the Indians, but because it was the French and their Indian allies against Britain and Britain's Indian allies. And so one of the individuals I profile is a Mohawk chief who was called Joseph Brandt. And Joseph Brandt thought about this. And so, so my people, are they going to be better off? Uh, siding with the Americans or better off siding with the British? And what happens if the Americans win? What happens if the British win? And so on. And so they have to make this calculation. Everybody has to make the calculation, not knowing how things are going to turn out. We, from a distance, we have the advantage. We have the shortcut of hindsight. We know how it turned out. So we can say, ah, good decision there, Ben Franklin. You know, bad decision there, Thomas Hutchinson. But they didn't know. They didn't know how this was going to turn out. And so Brandt makes this decision. And in fact, the decision splits the Mohawk tribe. It splits the Iroquois Confederacy of which the Mohawk tribe was part. And so Joseph Brandt, you know, he sides with the British and he has to live with the consequences. It applied to women as well. One of the individuals that I focus on was a woman named Grace Groudon Galloway. She was the daughter of a wealthy individual in Pennsylvania. And she married Joseph Galloway, who was a prominent Pennsylvania politician, an ally of Benjamin Franklin. But unlike Benjamin Franklin, Joseph Galloway became a loyalist. And kind of because her husband was a loyalist, she became a loyalist. Or wait, maybe it was the other way around. She had strong loyalist leanings, and she quite possibly influenced her husband. So in relationships like this, the influence goes both ways. But what happened to her was that she did fine while the British were doing well. She was openly a loyalist. And when the British occupied Philadelphia, for example, which was where she was living at the time, she was happy. In fact, she describes how happy she and the other loyalists were to see the British march in and occupy Philadelphia. Now, in the standard American history of this, that's a disastrous moment. George Washington's army is driven away from Philadelphia, and they have to go out and spend this terrible winter at Valley Forge. But the winter, that same winter, was a good winter for Grace Galloway. But the British eventually change their minds about the value of Philadelphia, and they leave Philadelphia, the British troops do. And away goes Joseph Galloway, who had been a close ally and consultant to the British soldiers, and his life is forfeit. Hey, he cannot stick around when the Patriots come back and reoccupy Philadelphia. And he advises his wife, Grace, you stay behind. They're not going to harm you and see if you can preserve our property. Because one of the things that was automatically forfeit was the property of the loyalists. Now, in fact, Joseph Galloway eventually flees America for England, leaving grace behind, and she has to deal with the consequences of this. I'm able to tell this story because Grace Galloway kept a diary. And so it's possible to see what life was like for a loyalist woman in America, both when times were good for the loyalists and when times were bad for the loyalists. And I'm not going to spoil the story by saying what happens to her, but hers was one of the less happy endings. So these are the questions that I pose. And I, again, I return to this question of what makes people make these decisions? And I don't, I certainly don't presuppose that either side in this is right. I just, I want readers to try to understand why the decisions were made the way they were. And readers, just like my students, they're free to form whatever judgments that they want to judge. I like to think that I give them the material, the evidence on which to base those judgments. So one of the reasons that I don't play referee between the Patriots and the Loyalists is that I have long ago concluded that these basic, these basic evaluations, these basic judgments in history say a whole lot more about the individual making the judgments than they do about the facts on the ground of history.
And so just as well, I haven't mentioned William Franklin. William Franklin was the son of Benjamin Franklin. And he was a loyalist. His father was a rebel. Now, they both looked at the same set of political circumstances. For both of them, the big history was the same, but they came to opposite conclusions on this. And I try to make as strong a case for William Franklin. You know, I show the world as it looked to William Franklin. I show the world as it looked to Benjamin Franklin. They made what seemed to them to be perfectly reasonable decisions. And so what I really want to know is, again, this basic question, what prompts somebody to forsake his country and take arms against it? And the corollary of that is, what prompts another set of people in essentially the same circumstances to make the opposite decision? So that's, that's what I try to accomplish in the book. Let's see, Claire, if we have any questions. Have we got any? I think we've got some. I see that there's a number on the Q&A. So what do people want to know? Well, we have a few. And if you've been sitting on your question and haven't yet put it into the Q&A, now is the time. But I just wanted to ask just one question before we get into the audience questions, just to kind of orient us a little bit, because you specified that there's, you know, third, approximately third of the American population at the time of the outbreak of the American Revolution would have considered themselves to be loyalists, a third, um, you know, patriots, and then a third um, undecided. Did you, do you see over that structure any kind of geographic orientation of the, those populations? Like where were the patriots and who were the loyalists? I know Georgia was one of the only, uh, was the only colony to not send delegates, right, to the first right. Continental Congress. Yeah. So, so the, answer to the, the answer to your question is that it's complicated. And one of the things that I find to be a parallel between then and now is that we, to the extent that we're seeing this separating out, it doesn't have today, it doesn't have a nice, neat geography. Mm -hmm. So the separation of individual identities, the separation of loyalties that occurred in the 1850s and 1860s was unusual in that it was geographically determined. If you were in the South, you tended to look on the world one way. If you were in the North, you tended to look on the public affairs of the time a different way. And so there you could have a group that's saying, okay, we want out of this union. And it was a relatively neat break. But I would point out that even then, not all the slave states seceded from the union. There were 15 slave states, 11 went out, four remained loyal to the union. So it wasn't as clear cut even then. But the situation in the 1770s and 1780s was like the situation today in that, no, you couldn't say this community is loyalist, this community is patriot. You couldn't say this family is loyalist, this family is patriot. You couldn't even say within a family, these are loyalists and these are patriots. It really depended on the individuals. Now, having said that, once the fighting started, there was some sifting that took place. I mentioned that New York City was an epicenter of loyalism, but that was only after the British chased George Washington and the Continental Army away. And the British established that as their base of military operations. So with the British there, the people who... the the residents of New York, the ones who were loyalists, they came out and waved their loyalist flags. The ones who were patriots either just shut up and kept their heads down, or in some cases they left. But this happened in Boston. So during the siege of Boston at the beginning of the Revolutionary War, the British held Boston. And so the loyalists were riding high and they could speak their views openly because there were British troops all around to protect them. But when they left, then their neighbors who had been patriots and kept their mouths shut while the British were there, they undertook reprisals against the loyalists. And this was, this was one of the nasty aspects of the American Revolution. And in fact, just even in terms of organized fighting, the most bitter fighting, the most brutal fighting took place not between Americans and British, but between Americans and Americans. And it was thought by the British that they had more support in the South, that there were lots of loyalists in the South. And there were, but it turns out there were lots of patriots too. And I begin the book with this opening series of battles in the border region between South Carolina and North Carolina, including the Battle of the Waxhaws and the Battle of Kings Mountain and so on. And these were ones where the vast 
majority of the fighting was American on American. And to a remarkable degree, it was, these were battles with no quarter. We take no prisoners, we kill everybody. This was not the way it was done between the Americans and the British. And this is people who study civil wars, who know anything about civil wars, they observe this all the time. It seems paradoxical, but the people you are closest to, once you fall out with them, are the ones you hate the most. It's hard to, to generate a lot of hate against somebody you don't even know. So most Americans didn't know any British soldiers, so they couldn't really hate them. They represented this thing they didn't like, but they could hate that neighbor who had chosen the other side in this civil war. And it's the reason that I titled the book the way I did, and I bring out this aspect of the civil war. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Um, have a question about terminology here, which is interesting, and then a couple questions about kind of the origin of the conflict. Uh, one audience member asked uh, that they were wondering about the term American as it is applied to American Revolution, we are Americans, et cetera. Um, they comment that they had um, met some people from Central America who talked about how that term to, to the folks from Central America meant you know, that you live in the Americas, not necessarily that you're from the United States of America. Um, so their question is, do you know when the term American first kind of originated to describe what many people in the United States now refer to as Americans? Was that a, port, a product of the revolution or did it come later? It was a self-conscious political agenda item during the revolution because the states that declared independence of Britain identified themselves as states, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania and New York and Georgia and so on. And the people there thought of themselves as Pennsylvanians and Massachusetts men and New Yorkers and Marylanders and so on. But in order to make the revolution a success, the people who joined the Continental Congress said, we gotta work together. In fact, Benjamin Franklin famously is supposed to have said upon signing the Declaration of Independence, okay, we all must hang together or we will certainly hang separately. And so for the patriots, it was absolutely necessary that they portray the image of unity and they're all pulling together for this common purpose. But it was not a reality during the Revolutionary War. And George Washington tore his hair or his wig or whatever he tore in those days when the different states would refuse to pony up the requisitions that were made to support the Continental Army because they were putting their position as Pennsylvanians and New Jersey men and Connecticuters and so on before their position as Americans. But in the Declaration of Independence, there is the phrase, the United States of America. But at that point, it's not an identity thing, really. It's just a description. These United States and we're all in America. And nobody at that time would have said that we deny to people who live in South America the right to use the term America. That just, no, it never occurred to anybody. But eventually, when the war is won and there's a turning toward what do we do next, and especially we're going to have to create this new system of government and we're going to write a new constitution. Then, while the Articles of Confederation, the government that governed the United States during the war itself, when it was seen by these proponents of a new constitution as inadequate, they create this new system of government. And it's key for this new system of government that it operates not on the states but it operates on the people of America, which is why the Constitution, in contrast to the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of Independence talks about the United States of America, the United States, whereas the Constitution begins, we the people of the United States of America. And it's that, that's when those people who are in favor of this stronger central government, this more unified country, start using the term American. Now, and it's by the time people living in Central America get around to thinking of themselves and acting as Americans. Americans in the United States have pretty much de facto claimed the trademark on that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's just sort of, sort of the way it becomes. And United States of America is a mouthful. And so it's easier to simplify it, shorten it to America. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, sure. Howard and the audience wants to know, you talk about the role of 
when an individual is deciding, you know, they have a lot of factors in front of them between if they're going to be a loyalist or if they're going to be a patriot and take that, take that leap. Um, Howard wants to know what the position of the various state governors were at the outbreak of the American Revolution. What impact did that have on how the state contributed or didn't, just given the fact that statehood was so important at that time? Well, it, the first thing to remember is that as soon as the states declared independence, their existing governors were out of jobs because they were governors appointed by the British crown. And two of the patriots, excuse me, two of the loyalists that I focus on indeed were governors at the time of independence, Thomas Hutchinson, whom I mentioned, and William Franklin, who in fact was governor of New Jersey. And they both remained loyalist. Now, one could argue that they remained loyalist because that's where their paycheck was coming from. And that's part of the answer. Yeah, people often do arrange their beliefs, their views to support their material interest. But the influence also works the other way. One of the reasons that Thomas Hutchinson was made governor of Massachusetts was that the British government saw him as a loyal kind of person, likewise for William Franklin. So once the states declare independence, they've got to get new governors. And in fact, the old governors find out that they really are at risk for their lives. Thomas Hutchinson takes the first ship that's heading from Massachusetts to England, and he flees because he saw how badly he had been treated while Massachusetts was still part of the British Empire. And if it's no longer part of the British Empire and there aren't any British troops around to protect him, he's got to get out of there. So he does. William Franklin. William Franklin is in the position that certainly struck him as ironic and probably just downright unfair in that the day after New Jersey declared independence, William Franklin, who had spent the previous several years as governor of New Jersey and doing everything he could for the good of New Jersey, finds himself declared a traitor. Now, treason is a big deal, and usually it requires a lot of thought, and you make this big step to commit treason. But William Franklin was in the position of he hadn't made any step at all, and now he's a traitor. So. Typically, treason is a crime of commission. You actually have to do something. But in the American Revolution, in the midst of what I call this American Civil War, treason can be construed as a crime of omission. He simply didn't take the oath of loyalty to the new government. He was thrown in prison. He suffered in prison. He was sick in prison. He was not allowed to visit his wife, who was in New York, and she took sick and she died, and he was able to, unable to visit and comfort her. And eventually he had to go into exile. One of the things that I didn't say of how this all turns out for the loyalists and how it does relate also to the present. So the book was already with the printer at the end of this last summer when President Biden declared that American troops were going to pull out of Afghanistan after a long war there. And we all saw that the American withdrawal was messy, and people who had been associated with the American troops during the long war had to figure out how to get out of Afghanistan if they could, or how they were going to hunker down and avoid the rep reprisals that might follow. Well, I was watching this on television with everybody else and thinking about the fact that pretty much, I mean, darn near this, exactly the same thing happened at the end of the American Revolutionary War because the Loyalists were the equivalent then to the British, to what the Afghans who cooperated with the United States in Afghanistan were. And when the foreign power, the occupying power pulls out, those ones who sided with the occupying power, they got to figure out how are we going to survive? And just as those Afghans, they crowded to the airport trying to get a seat on the plane, some of them even clinging to the exterior of the planes. And by the way, for those of us who remember the American evacuation of Saigon at the end of the Vietnam War, where there's the videos of people clinging to the skids of the helicopters as they fly away, because they know if they stick around, they're probably going to be killed. Exactly the same sort of thing happened when the British evacuated New York City, because most of all the loyalists who could had congregated in New York City under the protection of the British Army and Navy. The British decide, okay, we're, we're out of here. 
And the loyalists say, well, we can't stick around. And so they jammed onto the British ships that were leaving in very large numbers. So somewhere between 60,000 and 100,000 loyalists fled the United States at the end of the Revolutionary War. It's one of the reasons that the American Revolution wasn't as bloody, ultimately, as the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or the Chinese Revolution or, or various other revolutions, because the losers basically had an exit strategy. They had a place that they could go. In those other revolutions, the losers, they didn't have any place to go and they were stuck. And so the reprisals were carried out upon them. But it's also one of the reasons that the loyalists are easy to forget in American history because they're gone and there's nobody around to say in the United States, oh yeah, my great grandfather was a loyalist. I mean, there's essentially nobody there because they all left. And they went to Canada, some of them went to Britain, some went to, went to the West Indies. Boston King, the enslaved man that I identified earlier, he wound up in West Africa, in the, the colony of Sierra Leone that the British established for emancipated slaves. He was emancipated, he did gain his freedom, and he went to West Africa. So the loyalists, they get read out of history. The patriots, they don't wanna remember this. The patriots want to recast this war as this noble effort by Americans to defeat the British. And they don't want to be reminded that not all Americans agreed with you and the ones who disagreed with you, you treated very badly. Nor did the British particularly want to be reminded of the loyalists because having loyalists around simply reminded the British of this war that they had lost. And here there's another parallel. American veterans of the Vietnam War, when they came home, they didn't receive, there weren't any victory parades because there wasn't a victory, but they often felt as though Americans simply wanted to forget about them. And Americans certainly did want to forget about the Vietnam War because it was this 10 year, 15 year war that turned out to be a loser. And Americans just didn't want to remember that, didn't want to be reminded. Political leaders, they don't want to bring it up. That's a downer when voters are going to the polls. So they often felt as though they'd been neglected. And I profile what happened to the loyalists and you know, where they went. William Franklin, he had a sad life. He was, he was the ranking British official in the American colonies upon the outbreak of the war. And he wound up essentially living in poverty in Britain. He had a small pension from the British government. For the rest, the British government says, uh, just go away. You remind us of this thing we want to forget. So interesting and the, the past present connections, you know, so clear there. Uh, there's a question from uh, Judy that I wanted to make sure we got to, and it's talking about the influence of the French enlightenment leaders in particular on the Patriots. Uh, Judy says, for example, I'd assume that Franklin's world fame and worldly personality might've caused him to be more directly connected to French thinkers and others. So how did these ideas that were floating around during the Enlightenment and other places in Europe, how did they make their way over into the Patriot cause? Was it you know, through those relationships some of the Patriots had with people in other countries or how, how did that happen? So Judy asks the question that is essential to any understanding of history. What's the connection between ideas and actions? And on those days when we like to think of ourselves as rational beings, we like to think the ideas come first and the ideas cause us to take actions. And that is true in some cases. But at least as often, we have emotional motivations to do things. And then we come up with reasons to justify what we want to do. And Franklin himself observed this. And one, at one point he said, it's a wonderful thing that humans are reasonable creatures because we can reason our way into just about anything that we want to do. Now, the connection with European enlightenment, in fact, before the American Revolution, to the extent that American thinkers connected with enlightenment thought in Europe, it was through the English enlightenment and especially the Scottish enlightenment. There wasn't a direct connection between America and French thinking, in large part because until the American Revolutionary War, France was the enemy. And it was, it was relatively difficult to travel from America to France. You really had to make an effort. There were a lot of people who were going from America to England and from America to Scotland. And so the writing of John Locke 
the writing of Adam Smith, people like this, who shared many of the same views and outlooks as the writers of the French Enlightenment. Nonetheless, it was filtered through the, the English speakers, through the Anglophones, to the American colonies. But I would also add that the influence ran in the other direction. So the American Revolution, and especially the words of people like Thomas Jefferson, you know, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and all of this, all men are created equal. Those words inspired a lot of French thinking. And so when the French launched their revolution, 20 years after, or 15 years after the American Revolution, they deliberately take pages from the American Revolution and from things like the Declaration of Independence. And so at, by that time, however, Americans and the French are allies. They've been allies against Britain. And so it's easier to make that kind of connection. And of course, during the Revolutionary War, people like the Marquis de Lafayette come over and they forge this connection. But it still, it still leaves open the question, so how important were these ideas? Was Franklin moved by the philosophical ideas that give rise to this? And the answer is to some degree, but this is where the answer always is, it depends on the individual, which again, I'll, I'll go back to this question of big history and little history. You can say in general, these ideas were in the air, but why did these ideas appear to motivate this person and not that person? Why were the ideas more compelling to Thomas Jefferson than to Thomas Hutchinson, who read the same books, who was exposed to the same ideas? One becomes the principal articulator of American independence and America's contribution to human rights. The other one defends British prerogatives in the American colonies. Speaking of uh, big history and little history, um, a little history question from Andrew. Uh, Andrew wants to know, in your opinion, it can be someone you profiled or someone you didn't, um, who would you say best represents the Patriots' cause and who best represents the Loyalist cause? Uh, I have a hard time answering that maybe in the way that Andrew wants to, to know, because I'm a firm believer in the particularity of history. And... I would say that this person represents a certain aspect of it. This person represents another aspect of it. To say that one represents an aspect better than another, but I'll do my best. So in the case of Benjamin Franklin and William Franklin, what this I think signifies is the importance of family and family dynamics in helping determine the decisions that people make. I mentioned that Benjamin Franklin had rebelled against his father. So there was apparently this rebellious streak in him. William Franklin wound up rebelling against his own father. But what that meant, if you rebel against a revolutionary, that means you're a loyalist. Benjamin Franklin had as hard a time dealing with this as his own father had dealing with Ben's rebellion. And one of the touching, indeed, very poignant stories here is the efforts by William Franklin to reconstruct the Franklin family after the war is over. And he wants to get together with his father. He wants to say, Father, we took opposite sides in the war. The war is over. Now let, let us be family again. And what really makes it poignant and utterly and ultimately heartbreaking is that there's a third Franklin male involved, the son of William Franklin, the grandson of Benjamin Franklin, who not only has to choose between Britain and America, he has to choose between his father and his grandfather. And circumstances led him to be raised mostly by his grandfather, but he's trying to forge this connection to his father, but he has to choose between these two most important males in his life because of the political difference between the two. When the war ends, Temple Franklin is what he was called. William Temple Franklin was his name. And Temple sorely wants his father and his grandfather to be reunited so he can put his own family life back together. And so he engineers a meeting between the two. Benjamin Franklin is leaving Paris to go home to Philadelphia for the last time. William Franklin is living in exile in London, but he comes to Southampton to meet Benjamin Franklin's ship. 
And William, excuse me, Temple Franklin is on the ship. And Temple has sent this letter to his father, William, saying, Father wants to see you. Come meet us. But Benjamin Franklin doesn't know that William's coming because Temple knew that if he told Benjamin his son was coming, Benjamin said, we're not going to stop there because Benjamin did not want to reconcile. And there is this very difficult moment when William says, Father, let bygones be bygones, and he puts out his hand. And as the historian and the person trying to understand these people, I try to keep my distance. I don't want to say, I want to have to choose between this and that. And so most of the time I'm able to do this, but this was a case when I was writing this part of the story and William puts out his hand and I wanted to just reach out across two and a half centuries of history and say, damn it, Ben, take your son's hand because I have three children. They're adults now. And I cannot imagine anything that they would do that would cause me to read them out of my life. And certainly, for heaven's sakes, not an issue of politics, but Benjamin Franklin let that happen. And so this is a case of, this is, so this is an answer to part of Andrew's question, that this is, these two exemplify the, the great emotional and family stakes involved in this entirely separate from the political stakes. It's definitely a striking example of family estrangement. That's just kind yeah. of, yeah, it's really hard to, to believe. Now we're getting down, unfortunately, to the end of our time together. And we have a lot of questions that uh, we're not going to be able to get to. So I sincerely apologize to everyone, but I'm looking at several of them and I can promise you that the answers are in the book. So if you haven't yet <laughs> purchased and read your copy, I highly encourage you to, but uh, Bryant just put in a question, which I think is a really wonderful one for us to end on. Okay. And he asked, given your opening comment about the current potential risk to our democracy, do you have any thoughts or insights from the research on your book as to what we can do to better protect its future? This is going to sound like an obvious answer coming from a historian and a history teacher. But if people look at what these growing rifts have cost in American history. So in the case of the Revolutionary War, the splitting of families, the loss of property, the loss of many lives. If you look at what happened during the American Civil War, the great disaster of American history, when between 600 and 700,000 people died. If this is what a growing separation leads to, it, it has in the past. So I hope that people today will look back and say, you know, this is dangerous stuff. You know, don't indulge anything like that for petty short-term political gains. Remember that this American experiment in self-government is something that cannot be taken for granted. Each generation has to cherish, preserve it, and hand it off to our successors, to our heirs. That's, we are the beneficiaries of this. The American system of democracy, of self-government, has been this tremendous success by world historical standards. It's delivered more opportunity, a higher standard of living, more liberty to more people over history than any other system. But don't take it for granted. It needs cultivation. And so don't do anything that will put it at risk. Wise words to end on this evening. And Professor Brands, thank you so much for coming back to Atlanta History Center. Again, even though it was virtual, you still brought so much insight and just a great conversation this evening. Again, to everyone in the audience, if you enjoyed what you listened to tonight, there is way more where that came from. And Professor Brand's new book, Our First Civil War, Patriots and Loyalists in the American Revolution. Again, you can get a copy from Atlanta History Center's museum store, 25% off. Um, just for tonight only. So make sure you get on that and get your copy. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there's a new exhibit open at Atlanta History Center is a traveling exhibit from the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, and it's called American Democracy. And it opens actually with the exact question that Professor Brands was asking tonight. What causes someone to turn away from their country in favor of founding a new one and what came out of that effort. So it's an examination of our democracy, how it was founded, how it has been expanded and changed and improved over the years. 
um, and how we can all be involved in, continue, in continuing that improvement shaping going forward. We have it at Atlanta History Center. It's open now until March 23rd. So if you haven't come and seen it yet, I highly encourage you to, if you're in Atlanta and you have a chance, uh, we'd love to see you. But again, Professor Brands, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you to everyone in the audience for spending your Wednesday evening with us. And we hope to see you next time. All right. Thanks, Claire. Keep up the good work. <laughs> thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.